Hello, Janet, former president, also BLS webmaster, recorder and keeper of that amazing BLS database, mm. which many of us consult all the time. So this has provided such important information to all for all decisions relating to distribution, conservation, everything. So this database is the one of the most important things that the British Lichen Society does. But she's also a plant ecologist and lichenologist at Newcastle University, where among many things, she has made a special study of lichen communities of metalliferous sites. And that's where she is taking you today. Please, Janet. <laughs> okay, well, hello everybody. And this is gonna be a bit of a change of scene from the Atlantic Hazelwoods. Um, let me just share my screen with you. Okay, are you seeing my screen? Can somebody tell me? Looks good, Janet. Yes, we can see it, Janet. Is it good? Okay. Yeah, perfect. Right. Brilliant. Okay. So, welcome to the North Pennines, where we had snow this morning. Um, this... Uh, what, what I'm going to do now is to give you a very quick tour of just a few of my favourite sites in one particular part of the North Pennines where the lichens are particularly interesting and I'll show you a few of the species. Uh, I can't, I haven't got time to show you very many but um, just enough to give you a flavour hopefully. This uh, site that's shown here is Rookup. Um, this is Grove Rake Mine at Rookup. And this was actually the last of the lead mines to close in the North Pennines. It only closed a few years ago. Uh, and it's interesting to see, firstly, for the landscape. Um, this is typical of the landscape in which these metal mines are set in Britain. They're in the uplands, very bleak, very open. Um, but also, I've put it in because actually this being a fairly fresh site, has virtually no lichen interest at all. And one of the things that we need to look for when looking out for good lichen sites is how old the mine is, and the older the mine is, the better. So, first of all, where are we? Uh, you can see from the map on the right that um, there are a number of ore fields, metal mining ore fields in Britain. This map only shows England and Wales, but there are mines in Scotland as well. And the ore field that I'm concerned with is the one that's called the North Pennines, which is the one that's ringed in red. So it's right up at the top end, the northern end of England, not that far from the Scottish border. And it's, it's in a central location. The Pennines are the hills that run up the spine of England, if you like. And this is right at the northern end of that. And you can see from the map on the left um, that it's, in English terms, relatively high. Um, Cross Fell is the highest point on the Pennines and that's actually um, within this area. The geology is Carboniferous, it's limestones and sandstones, uh, which gives rise to a soil that's fairly neutral. This is very different to most of the other ore fields, um, which are either purely limestone or they're very silicious rock, very acid rock. In the North Pennines we've got a mixture of the two. Um, and that gives rise to a quite a special vascular plant and lichen flora. The part of the North Pennine ore field that I'm concerned with is the bit that's shown in green on this map. And this, um, this is the area that was mined not only for lead, but also for zinc. And zinc is much more toxic to plants and to animals. And so that, again, gives rise to a very special flora. So the first site I want to take you to is quite an early mining site. We don't know how early, uh, but there are anecdotes of somebody having dug into one of the shafts here and found an antler tool, which suggests, you know, really very early mining indeed. Um, certainly there was medieval mining in this area and through to about the 17th century, but it then seems to have been abandoned. So the contaminated ground that we've got on this site, uh, the locals call it the wastes. Um, this is, you know, it's been stable. It's been there for a good long time, plenty of time for interesting lichen communities to develop. 
One of the plants that's characteristic here is the mountain pansy. And I'm going to mention a few of these plants because in the North Pennines, they are really good indicators of what type of contamination there is in the ground and the level of the contamination. So if you get mountain pansy in amongst the grass, you know you've got lead there. You can be pretty sure in this area that there's lead and, and that the lead is not at very high levels so low level contamination but that's in the areas that are grassed over you'll also notice there that we've got quite large spreads of open stony ground and they're much more highly contaminated that's what it looks like more close up and on that open stony ground you've got another plant you've got spring sandwort and this is highly tolerant of really extreme levels of lead and zinc contamination and the fact that these areas have been open for hundreds of years you know, pretty well confirms that. So what sort of things do we find here? Well, starting with that open stony ground first, what do we get on the stone? Actually, nothing very interesting, or at least not a lot that's very interesting. It's very much the usual upland assemblage because the rock itself doesn't contain the metals. This is rock that's been discarded, most of it. And the only rock that actually has any great interest on it is rock that's rich in iron. And there is a special suite of metallophyte lichens that are saxiclus on iron rich rock. Um, many more of them that you can find in Wales, but in the North Pennines, not so many. Uh, the one that's most common is Rhizocarpon erderi, which is shown at the top left there. And also Porpidias. Uh, we get a great wealth of Porpidias and they're not easy to tell apart. Um, but one of the most distinctive ones is Propidia melanodes, which is shown bottom left there. The others, I've just put a couple of Fuscidias in, um, just to give you an idea of the sort of upland Saxicolus flora that we have in this area. So the rock itself is not of great deal of interest. What does start to get interesting is what's growing on the ground and on small fragments of rock in that open stony ground. And there, of course, we get to Styria cowlons. Mine sites equals Styria cowlons to many of us. It certainly does to me. And these are wonderful lichens. The one on the left is Styria cowlon vesuvianum, familiar to us all from the British uplands, those of us who are lucky enough to work in the uplands. But it's not the same variety. The one that you normally get in the uplands is vesuvianum vesuvianum. But here on contaminated ground throughout the Pennines and in Wales as well, it's almost entirely var nodulosum, which has a slightly different structure. You can see those sort of bobbles, the nodules, if you like, at the tips. Um, and it's, it almost seems to be restricted to the mine sites. And as soon as you walk off the contaminated ground and go on to the moorland adjacent, it reverts back to being the usual var vesuvianum. I have no idea why that is. If anyone can tell me, I'd love to know. Styricale on dactyphyllum. Um, is the one at the bottom there, much bigger lichen, uh, usually abundantly fertile. And in this area where zinc was being mined, Styriacal on Nanodes, which is the one at the top right there. Cladonias, we get Cladonias, of course we have Cladonias. Uh, a great wealth of Cladonias, mostly again the usual upland species. But on the mine sites, including this one that I'm talking about, Cladonia scabrioscula turns up, um, sometimes difficult to tell from a rather scrappy Cladonia furcata, uh, but there is definitely real scabrioscula there as well. That's the picture top left. Cladonia cariosa is quite common on this open stony ground. And then the one on the right is Cladonia uncialis, again, another very familiar upland lichen. But the one that we normally see is subspecies Bionchialis, which sprawls flat on the ground, sort of under heather, usually. And in these sites, on the contaminated ground, if it's really undisturbed, it adopts its upright form, forming these big cushions of erect Padesia. And uh, there's a close-up there. You can see what they look like at the tips. So they split four ways, usually, at the tips with that sort of star shape appearance and the big round central opening. 
this seems to be increasing. We're picking this up more and more on the North Pennine sites and it's in Mid Wales as well. It's turning up on the Mid Wales mines as well now. So moving on from the early mining to a site, um, or a whole group of sites really, that were most intensively mined in the 18th and 19th centuries. And that's actually most of the lead mines, the metal mines in the North Pennines. So the peak of mining activity started about 1760 and carried on through to towards the end of the 19th century. Initially lead and then there was a spate, a short period of zinc mining at the end of that. At this time, mining became much more mechanised. All sorts of machinery was developed that helped in the process of separating the metal rich ores from the rock that they were brought up in. In the early mining time, that was done by the women and children with hammers just sitting there on the ground splitting the rock. By this time, there's a lot of machinery involved. The work was still done by the women and children, I should say. The men were working below ground, but it was a much more efficient process and could process a great deal more ore. And the area where this was done in each mine was called the dressing floor or ore dressing floor. And you can see a reconstruction of one there at Killop and a very nice example of one at White Syke below it. The White Syke site was abandoned about 120 years ago. And you can see the similarity between them. This is where the contaminated ground is because this was a very dusty process and there was a great deal of ore um, in that dust and the dust got into everything. It got into the walls and the buildings, it got into the ground, it's in the spoil heaps and it also got into the rivers. Some sites also had on-site smelt mills or smelters and these produced highly contaminated waste. So where you've got a site that also has a smelter and in this case this is Nenthead Mines where there were at least five major mines um, each with their own dressing floor. A incredibly dusty, noisy, busy place it was and there was also a smelter and there was waste from the smelter. So this is yeah this is one of the richest sites that we have for lichens. That's the spoil associated with the old smelter and it's a very good place for looking at soil crust lichens. The bio biological soil crust, if I can say that, um, includes lichens, also fungi, cyanobacteria, bacteria, all sorts of other things. Um, but the lichens in it, you get things like sarcosagium, and Vesdayas, there's a couple of Vesdayas there for you, Estivalis at the bottom, I think, and Leprosa at the top. On the highly contaminated ground, if there's a lot of zinc, we've got another indicator plant, and this one's Alpine Pennycress. And there are also moss indicators. Um, there are several of them, but the most conspicuous one is this one that forms these bright red cushions. Uh, it's a lovely thing. Brian Palans, the pale thread moss. And these plants are so useful because you can just follow them, you know, just go to them and you know where the contamination is. And that tells you where to look because some of these sites are huge. They're really big and actually finding the good lichen sites is not easy, but use the plants. Um, it saves a lot of time. One I particularly wanted to mention that we get at Nenthead and another, quite a few of the other high altitude sites is Ocrelechia frigida. It's not a metallophyte as such because you get it elsewhere in the uplands as well. But it interests me from an ecological point of view. From a distance it looks just like a, a dusting of snow on the ground, just what we would have had this morning. Go in close and it's Ocrelechia frigida. It's got this sort of fish bones appearance to it. Um, it's a lovely thing. But if you go into Wales, in mid Wales, on some of the mines there, you find something that from the distance looks exactly the same. Looks a bit like a dusting of snow on the ground. Go in close here, where the rock is much more acidic, and it's not Ocrelechia, it's Styriacaulum condensatum. And you look at the structure of condensatum, I haven't actually got a close up there, but it's remarkably similar in its form, not its taxonomy, but in its form and its colour 
very similar to Ocrelechia frigida. So these two are occupying exactly the same ecological niche, but in two slightly different habitats, both of them highly contaminated with heavy metals. Interesting. There you go. We have Lycaniclus fungi as well. Um, we have a lot of Biomyces rufus in this area, and that is often colonised by Epilichon scabrosus, which you can see at the top there. And another common lichen that sports uh, Lycaniclus fungi is Cetraria aculeata. Um, and this one hosts Tenialella rolfii, which you can see as these little pale galls at the tips of the spikes. It's, we have very few records for rolfii in Britain. Um, and almost all of them are at Nenthead or within a couple of miles of this Nenthead centre of zinc mining. So it seems to be associated with very high levels of zinc. Just moving downstream from the mines, I said that a lot of the waste material that was contaminated with heavy metals was just thrown away in the river. It was dumped in the river and washed away, washed downstream, where it accumulated in alluvial gravels. These are fantastic sites because these alluvial gravels are very big. Um, you know, um, the one I'm showing you there is about a mile long, filling the bottom of this valley. And it's a great extent of contaminated ground. There's a lot more contaminated ground on the river gravels than there is now on the mines. And it has, this particular one has very high levels of lead, zinc and cadmium in it. And it supports all the same lichens that we have at Nenthead and all those wonderful Lycanicholas fungi as well. So not to be overlooked. And as you move downstream, the metal levels are lower in the river gravels. The contamination gradually gets diluted by the river and washed out into the North Sea, where there's a lot of it. These sites are now grassing over and even going to scrub. But with the grass come the peltigeras and we get uh, things like Peltigera necari, leucophlebia, and this lovely little one in the middle there, Peltigera venosa. Janet, we have about two minutes. To and wrap I'm finished. Up. That's it. I'm done. Excellent. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about perfect, that. Perfect timing. <laughs> it was perfect timing. Janet, thank you so much. That was just absolutely brilliant. It's such an honour to see some of your study sites and the sort of the stunning lichen diversity that is found there. Now, there isn't any questions that have come in just <laughs> yet, but I do have one myself. Mm -hmm. And I'm quite interested to know how the metalliferous sites that we have here in the UK, how do they fare internationally? So do we have um, any endemics, for example, that aren't necessarily found elsewhere outside of the UK? I believe we do, but to what extent that's under recording, I don't know. Um, I've looked more at the plants, the vascular plants in that context, and certainly the, um, the habitat, it's, it's known as Calaminarian grasslands. And our Calaminarian grasslands in Britain are very distinct um, and with a different flora to the metal contaminated sites anywhere else in the world. And given that our plant communities are unique, um, I think as communities, the lichen communities are as well. How many of the species are actually endemic to Britain? Um, I'm not entirely sure I'm a bit out of date on that, to be honest. Yeah. I, certainly the last time I looked, which was back when I was doing my PhD quite some time ago, um, at that point, there were thought to be quite a few of them. That's unsurprising, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great, thank you. So questions are now flooding in. Uh -huh. So John Skinner asks, is there pressure to decontaminate these sites? Yes, there is. And I've been resisting it so hard over the years, but it, I'm fighting a losing battle, really. Um, a huge amount of money is being poured into decontaminating the Nent Head area um, okay. and particularly the rivers. And this was European money, but despite recent events, I understand that the money is already there and they're going to carry on spending it. So they are decontaminating mm -hmm. the, the sites and the rivers, and we are losing a lot of the lichen interest as a result. But we're losing the lichen interest anyway, because these are post-industrial sites, they're temporary, mm -hmm. and gradually they are grassing over. 
um, and you know with the grass we lose the lichens and with the amount of nitrogen deposition we're getting in the uplands now that process is actually proceeding apace so I, I'm very lucky to have looked at these sites while they were still good. <laughs> Oh, Janet, bless you. That's great. Thank you. Uh, we've got time for one more question. And um, well, from Claudia Calessi. Uh, Claudia would be interested, interested to know the extent of the soil crust on the sites you work at and how big are they? The soil crusts? Mm. Really, they're over all of that open stony ground. Wherever there aren't vascular plants, so basically wherever the grass can't get in, there is a soil crust and that soil crust is really important ecologically because it forms a, a cover. You know, it's, it's very thin, um, but it forms a, a cover over that soil surface, which prevents erosion. And without that, the heavy rain that we get in the Pennines, um, you know, it, it would just break up the soil surface and that would prevent any colonisation by lichens or anything else. So they, they are extensive and they have not been much studied at all. Um, this is something that I, I would really like to get into because I have no idea what's in these crusts apart from the lichens. And even most of the lichens are completely unidentifiable. <laughs> Sounds like a good project that someone needs to take on. <laughs> There's a PhD for somebody in this. Yes, <laughs> that's brilliant. Oh, Janet, that was excellent. Thank you ever so much. So your time's up. And um, yeah, I applaud you on behalf of the whole audience. That was just a really beautiful talk. Thank you ever so much. Thank you very much. Fantastic.